Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the Origina session. I uh, hope you're all having a good time here in Dallas. Those of you non-Texans, hope you can all hear me okay. There is one or two seats still knocking around if you'd like to have a seat. Anybody feeling a little tired just standing up all day? Um, let me just introduce myself. My name is Tomas O'Leary. I'm the CEO and founder of Origina. And uh, my company is, uh, I get this thing to work, a the global leader in IBM software support. Independent software support to IBM software, okay? Um, and I'm really happy to talk to you all today because I want to describe, we've been in this kid business for the last eight years, and we talked to many people here in the room already, um, and to many yesterday as well, as yesterday afternoon, yesterday evening. And what we want to do is be able to help you understand, you get a good idea in your business, what we call like the no-brainer idea. How do you get that through the organization without getting blocked, okay? Now, I hope you guys like board games, do you? Anyone like board games and play board games at home? Well, I do. I've got children at home and they still love playing the board games. So we're gonna play a game this afternoon. Um, but before we do that, I'd like to just explain what, we're, what it is we're trying to talk about here, is that these sort of ideas, like using Origina, for example, we're going to show you the idea real quick, and then I'm going to take you through why the really good idea is still very tricky to get through your organization, okay? Um, and we're going to use an idea of a board game to show you that, okay? So, um, Rich is going to save you 60%. If you've been to a boot, you've seen this. We can save you 60% on average, and this is factually be backed up on your IBM software support. What is not to like, okay? This is a genuine opportunity for you to save money, okay? So you meet us, you have a conversation at the booth, and we demonstrate to you, and this is a real example where we were able to show for one client, $57 million savings over five years on IBM software support. That's genuine savings. We give it to you obviously at a lower cost, clearly. We give you better quality support. We'll give you be more responsive to your requirements, faster than IBM currently do, and we give you access to your IBM, the IBM experts that you're increasingly finding difficult to get your hands on, okay? No brainer. This has got to be easy, yeah? Surely everyone's going to buy this. But unlike Chris Voss, who spoke yesterday, so I hope we all saw Christopher Voss, this behind negotiator. So I hadn't done his crash course yesterday morning when we did the presentation, so to look for the no, but unfortunately what we're going to get here is a lot of no's, okay? And this is not a good thing because you're getting the no's from your CSO, your CFO, your CIO, your IT architects, technical guys, they're telling you no. And you're going, but this is a no-brainer. Surely we can get this through. And why are they saying it's no? They're telling you to say it's no because ultimately they're on a different page. They're, they haven't gone through the journey that you've already gone through, for example, with us, let's say. So you're at a point in your journey where you can see the genuine savings of $57 million, but you can't get it past these guys. So what do you do? Well, you all remember this game, I'm sure. You got it? In Europe, we call this snakes and ladders. Here in the United States, you call it shoots and ladders. I don't know what you had against snakes, but uh, that was back in 1943. I checked it out on Wikipedia earlier. This is a, this is a game that's been around for, for, for millennia. Actually, it's been around for a long, long time. Very old game, very simple game. But actually, it is, it's a kind of a map of our organization. You know, we start here, we go up the ladders, down the chutes. It's, this, is, this is life, this is everyday life, we live it, okay? And particularly as software asset managers, sourcing, procurement, vendor manager, manager professionals, and financial asset managers, you guys are coming through this all the time, okay? And what we want to do is explain, using our example, how you would do, how you go about this. So I want to give you the rules of the game to start with, okay? So to get the $57 million over the line, what do you need to do? Well, the first thing you got to do is figure out who are these blockers? Who are those people who will stop the, stop the block, okay? So you've got to be ultimately figure out who they are. I've shown you already, typically, every organization may have different, slightly different titles. There may be more of them, but broadly speaking, they fall into the four categories I've shown you. You've got the, the chief security officer, 
We get the IT architect who represents all the technical people who look after the products on a day-to-day -day basis. You got the chief financial officers looking after money, after the structure. And then you got the CIO ultimately who has the, has the ultimate responsibility. Okay? So they're the people you have to get over, get, get over, get out, get past. You have to have the answers to their questions ready. You need to anticipate what they are going to ask you. Okay? And this is what we're going to help you with. And you also not just you don't need to anticipate their questions. You need to anticipate what are their concerns, what are their worries. You need to understand and put yourself in their shoes, and you need to have all those answers. And you need to eliminate all potential risks. This is a game that needs to be played correctly. Okay? Okay. So there are the rules. So this is us. I forgot the tie, the red tie. So we're going to go through the game. And the first place we're going to go is to the IT architect. Okay? So naturally he's told me no. He goes, what does the IT architect care? What do, what do the techie guys care about? They, their biggest concern is the quality of support. They don't care about the money. They don't care about the budget even. They care about the quality support. Because ultimately they say, if the systems are going down at 3 o'clock in the morning, who gets the call? They get the call. That's their biggest concern. So how you've come with this $57 million opportunity and they're going to say no. And of course they're going to say no because you have to understand what their issue is. So how do you do that? Well, the sort of questions you're going to get asked are, how do we guarantee that original support will be able to match IBM's? And can, I, can, I, can original really fix the problems? How do you demonstrate that? Well, you've got to bring us into the game. You bring our technical people to talk to them. Simple. Ultimately, these are the people going to be responding to them. If they're not happy with the technical resources we have, well, you shouldn't be doing business with us. You shouldn't be doing business with anybody unless you're happy with the technical resources. So absolutely, you've got to make sure that you've got, got the right people. The other sort of questions they're going to ask are, well, you know, and this doesn't happen that often, but it does in some organizations. The key technical guy for the key product goes, well, I know all the guys in IBM laboratories. I know all the techies personally because we go to the conferences every year. And he's looking at it over a period of 20 years. He probably hasn't been to a conference in five or more, but in his, his mind's eye, it was only last week. And how do you deal with that? Well, actually, similarly to how we handled the other issue, it's about meeting the people. But what he also probably misses in the whole picture, given the changes within IBM themselves, what you're looking at is a potential, and this has also been proven by example, the very people he's asking to have a relationship are no longer in IBM. They've left. They've gone out of the organization. He doesn't know that. And in one or two instances, we found that actually they're part of our team. we are brought back into them. So it's important that you go through this, but you've got to put yourself in the, in, in, in the technical architect's shoes, and it's by introducing the technical resources. The other area that they're always going to come to you about is, well, we want to be on the latest version of IBM software. That's, you know, our policy is to be on the latest version. Now, this needs to be challenged. The reason it needs to be challenged is that in everyday life, it is very unlikely, no matter how good this IT architect is, that he will be aware of every single version of every single product across his entire stack. Now, Let's imagine even if he was, he's the best organized guy around. He's not going to know for every single one of those products, for every single vendor, what versions are actually current and available and supported by each of the vendors. He's never going to know that. So it's really important he's probably going to be out of date. And you've got to figure out what version does he really need to go to? Why does he need to go to that? And for which products? Is it for every product? Is it for the whole estate? Is it just for one unit? Because it's really important to tease that out. Because clearly if he needs to go to the next version that's coming out next year, assuming there is a version coming out next year, which for many cases there's not for a lot of these products, okay, that's the first point, he needs to know which, what version he wants to go to, what, how does he want to do it. So it's important to go through that with him. And there may well be a way of getting around this, and in most cases it is. There may be only one pocket of the, of the area that there's a problem in. Once you got past the IT architect, he says, go ahead, where do you go then? Well, the CFO, because ultimately the CFO is going to come and talk to you, and what does he care about? He's thinking about cost, he's thinking about hassle, he's thinking about efficiency. So he's going to ask you a question like, do we really need more IBM suppliers? Are we not trying to consolidate? Obvious one. Well, of course, but why, 
quite, you know, particularly if they're talking to us, you look at the fifty-seven million dollars of savings. He's saying, okay, I like the savings, but yeah, they are they real? But ultimately, he's, if you're looking at the consolidation, okay, and trying to remove a vendor, what quicker way to remove that vendor from your environment than having a much more cost-effective, much more flexible offering on the table, and where you can demonstrate that the savings are real? And also that you've already got the buy-in of the IT guys. Okay, so that's the first question I'll ask. The second area he'll probably focus in on is an area that all of you were very familiar with is audit. So the type of question he'll ask is, will this not trigger an IBM audit? Are they not going to just walk in here now? Well, the reality is, you know, they're more, more or less likely to be audited by looking at something like this than you would be if you didn't do it. Audit is about your compliance, and you have to be compliant. You have to be. Now, we could argue about whether the, the vendors and IBM or any other vendors are too aggressive in how they audit. Are they a little bit sneaky in what they do? I would argue that they are. Maybe others might be different view. But ultimately, you still have to be compliant. You still have to know what you're using and be up to speed. That has nothing to do with support and maintenance for the licenses you bought up to that point in time. All right? The other sort of question they would ask you is, well, okay, 56, 56 $57 million of savings. Okay, let's, let's go first, but let's wait till a renewal is coming up, like we're going to do a renewal, it's up in January, we'll get, we'll get a quote from them on the, on the 1st of December or the 31st of December, and we'll see how, you can't do that, okay? Because this is not a like-for-like -like comparison. We don't sell SNS. we sell an alternative to IBM's SNS service. So it's important that you understand that, and be, to be able to, to buy this service, there's a little bit of work that you need to do, and there's a passage of time. And even if you decide to buy it, you need to make sure you're ready for the onboarding of the, of, of the service, okay? So that won't work either. And the CF, CFO says, okay, I get it, I'm with you. So where do we go then? You go to the CSO. Now, many of the questions that the CSO will ask you will have already been covered in some, to some extent by the IT architect, but who has to stand over this? Who has to be worried about risk? That's what the CSO is looking at. So we need to handle their, their issues, their concerns. The sort of question you're going to get asked is something like, who will give us the softer fixes for each product when we need them? A really good and really important question, okay? So, but you need to look at each product individually. Okay, you can't just say, that, that's a blanket statement that could kill the whole thing. You've got everybody on board already. You need to go back to the basics. Now, many of these things are going to be covered already, but you have to cover them and you need to bring them to the CSO because the CSO will be the ultimate person who will sign off on this. Okay? So you need to go with... For, so, for example, are the fixes already released by, by IBM that you can already get access to them? How often do you actually apply fixes to that particular product? When was the last time you applied a fix? What did you apply it for? Did you have to buy a fix or was there another way around it? These are the sort of questions you need to get into. You can't just say, oh yeah, fixes, that's the end of the conversation, because it's not. And ultimately as well, workarounds and configuration changes for stable products that have been in your environments, and the technical guys will agree with this, you, sometimes it's an awful lot better and an awful lot safer to actually go with configuration changes or workarounds than doing anything to the product itself, all right? And the other question to ask the CSO as well, is it actually a sensible first line of defense? Is this our first line of defense that actually patches is that is where we're dealing, what we're dealing with? Because if it is, you probably have a bigger problem anyway, okay? So my, my, my advice to you here is you need to take it through. It'll come up here and it'll come up here, okay? You get a yes from the CSO, you go to the CIO. Okay, surely at this stage you got it over the line. Actually, no, we've seen this, these, these opportunities being blocked. The sort of thing you're looking at here is, clearly they're gonna say, yeah, well, IBM support is not a priority. You, 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 the CSO, CIO has so many things on their table. They're not gonna be interested in this off the bat. IBM support, well, if, particularly if you're already planning to move away from IBM long-term. So IBM support is not gonna be on the agenda. However, many other things will be. Can the savings of $57 million help you do more of those projects? All right? Or I should ask the question the way Chris told it. I wrote it down here. Is it a bad idea to have more money available for those other projects? I think that's a no, isn't it? <laughs> Can't be a bad idea. Of course it's a good idea. All right? So, but ultimately, remember another point here. Not just the money that you'll save to go do the other project, or gain to get do the other projects. What happens if actually 
because of your lack of attention and focus away from IBM, you start, you start to defocus on IBM software, okay? IBM themselves are starting to move their expertise away from IBM software, as we clearly know with the redundancies in the marketplace, and also from the sale of their, some of their assets to the likes of HCL and Acoustic, where they've sold off some of their products. So they are moving away, you're moving away, yet these systems, by the way, are still running mission-critical environments. That hasn't changed, okay? So IBM support could well be a very, very serious issue for your CIO at some point in the next 12 months, if you're not careful. And we have some real-life examples of this. There's a European retailer we work with, and this is a true story. They, they brought us in initially on a trial basis. And when they have this environment that they have, it's absolutely critical. As you can imagine retail, what's your peak times? You're talking about particularly online retail, you're looking at um, Black Friday, Cyber Monday, and then obviously the Christmas period. Everything is built around this, okay? So you're dealing with systems that are always under huge, huge stress at two to three times periods of, of the year, okay? So well, they brought us in an issue to look, at, to look at this as part of a potential migration. What they ended up doing and realizing is that we were able to do two things. One, we were able to keep the lights on, which was critical, okay? So keeping the lights on at a lower cost with a better service, all those things they bought into and they're actually getting today. But the thing that they actually really, really valued more than all, all of that together was, as well as that in their service, because of our access to the IBM experts, our people in the build up to Cyber Monday were able to provide small bits of advice and guidance, configuration changes, architectural changes that made a huge difference to the risk to the business as they got closer to those dates. So ultimately, we were able to provide two things at the same time, all at a lower cost. The last thing the CIO might say to you, okay, should I be worried about this damaging our relationship with IBM? Of course, yes, you should be. I mean, we all have relationships with these companies going back a long time, and that's and our, our intention is not to damage your relationship with IBM. But it doesn't have to damage your relationship with IBM. We all have products and services in our organizations. <coughs> Excuse me. Get a bit of water. We all have products and services in our organizations that phase out. This is perfectly normal. There's nothing unusual about any of this. And this is what's happening here. These products are hitting the point in the life cycle where they're being phased out of your organization. And there's nothing unusual about that. And the fact that an individual or some individuals might have an issue with it, that's neither here nor there. That shouldn't be your worry. IBM anyway, as I've just mentioned earlier, are selling some of their assets in any event already under your noses and sometimes you may or may not be aware of it. HCL just recently purchased seven of their products, includes products that you may have already been using, Big Fix, Domino, WebSphere Commerce, AppScan, amongst, amongst others. And they also moved a bunch of their marketing and Watson marketing products out to a, a, a private equity firm called Acoustic. So they're getting out of this business. So there's nothing to fear from this change. This is not something if it's handled correctly. Clearly, if you walk into IBM and say, we're kicking you out the door, we're bringing in original, that's going to upset people because that's done in an aggressive way. We don't suggest that you do that. Having done your due diligence, you'll know this is right for your business and you'll be able to do it correctly. It would be nice, however, I should add, if they were equally as careful and worried about your relationship with them, but that's neither here nor there. Okay, so. We win the game, all right? We get to the top of the ladder and we're done. What have we achieved? Well, as I said at the beginning, you've achieved a win. You've achieved a win for your company and you've achieved a very, very big win for you personally and professionally within your organization because you've managed to navigate the board game of your organization. You've managed to get up the ladders and down the chutes and get into the winning position. And that's what this is about. And you've got a yes from everybody in the team. And ultimately, if you want to join those organizations and many others who've done this, I'd encourage you to come and have a conversation with us at our booth on the right-hand side over there. If you haven't already, I recognize some faces being to us already. Maybe you had a whiskey last night. Thank you very much for your time. I hope you enjoyed the presentation, found it interesting. Look forward to talking to some of you later. Thank you.